Welcome to our service of worship this morning. And uh, as we come this morning to, to worship the risen Saviour, and we'd just like to welcome back the Reverend Harry Robson. Very welcome, Harry. And we look forward to hear the message that the Lord has laid upon your heart on this Easter morning. And, Lord, and just a couple of other announcements to make. Not that much on this week because we'll no, there will be no organisation or no meetings this week. But there will be a service this afternoon at 3 p.m. in Refrain at the War Memorial in remembrance of the late Jim Elliott, who was murdered by the IRA 50 years ago this incoming week on the 19th of April 1972. And we'd just like you to remember the Elliott family at this time in your prayers. And uh, we'd like the monies for the moderator appeal for Ukraine to be in today, please, if you could. We'd like to get that organised. And there's just one in our announcement here to do with the female focus. Our ladies plan to have a local walk on Monday evening, the 25th of April, followed by tea or coffee in the hall. <clears throat> As we continue our theme for the year of side by side, we'd love to see ladies of all ages coming along. There will be a choice of a short walk or a slightly longer walk, one, or feel free to come along for tea or coffee and a chat as we seek to reconnect and go forward. Full details, including times, will be given next Sunday, but please put that date in your diary. And next Sunday, our speaker will be Mr. Jim King. Prayer time, as usual, will be at 10.45, and Sunday school will meet at 11 a.m., plus the young teens. Thank you. I'll just hand over to Harry now. Thank you, David. Very nice to be back with you here in Ballyrone. And uh, there's no bigger day, is there, of the Christian year than this. Because he is risen. He is risen indeed. And so we join in singing his praise. Uh, See what a morning.
pray together. On this Easter day, Lord Jesus, we rejoice that death could not hold you in its grip and that you rose triumphant, greeting your amazed friends, convincing them that you were the same Jesus whom they had seen die and changing their sorrow to joy and giving them new life and new hope. And today, our living Lord, by your amazing grace, we too are your friends. So make yourself known to us in your risen power as we worship and adore you. Dispel our doubts too, and give us a joy that nothing can take from us. That that may be our blessed experience, we lay before you all that stops your light and your love flooding our lives, asking then your fresh forgiveness. Forgive us, O God, we who have too often gone our own way when a living Lord was at hand to guide and to lead. And forgive us, O God, we who have too often struggled on in our own strength when all the resources of eternity were available to us. And forgive us, O God, we who have been too slow to believe and too slow to obey. And forgive us for refusing the comfort of him who has conquered conquered death and the daily help of him who has conquered sin. Forgive us that we have been cast down and dismayed by the changes and chances of this world when our risen Savior has overcome the world. So grant us this day fresh eyes to see the Easter story, sincere hearts to believe the Easter message, that holding nothing back, we may say with Thomas, my Lord and my God, and all to your praise and pleasure. Amen. Now, boys and girls, if you'd like to come to the front, that would be brilliant. I know for some of you it's a long journey. Are we on? Have I muted it? Oh, no, I haven't. (laughs) There we are. Great, come on. Good to see you. Any more to come? Yep. We'll wait for you. Come on. Great. And then I see two more on their way. Did you see two more on their way? Maybe not. Okay. We off school? Anybody off school for a whole two weeks? Wow. Brilliant. Oh, there were two more. I thought I saw you. Come on. You off school? Brilliant. Have a seat. Just need you to to be able to see the screen here. Okay, either of these screens. Be great. Now, what say, instead of just playing around on the Easter holidays, we take a little bit of a trip? What about a nice flight on an aeroplane? Yeah? Wouldn't be bad, would it? Hmm? Where are you? You've been in one. Brilliant. You've been in one too. Anybody else been on an aeroplane? Oh, look at that. Everybody has nearly. That's okay. Great stuff. Great stuff. So if you're in an aeroplane, you're traveling, usually it can be at about 500 miles an hour or 800 kilometers per hour, whichever makes more sense to you. All right? Now, that's pretty fast. Yeah? That means that if we took off and had that speed, we would be in Belfast in less than three minutes. That would be really quick, wouldn't it? Yeah. Or if we decided we'd go to London... Well, that would take us just 40 minutes. Be there in no time. Or, let's say we really decided we'd go somewhere a wee bit different. 
classy. New York, why not? And that would only take us six and a half hours. We'd be there well before tea time. Yeah. Now, let's say we wanted to go a little bit further. What about a run right around the whole earth? So instead of just going one place, we would go around the whole lot and have a look at the whole lot. I wonder how long that would take. Well, that would take us, it would take us 50 hours, a couple of days. And we would be right away around. We would start at Ballaroni and we'd head right away around the world and we'd be back to Ballaroni in 50 hours. Good going. That's a lot to see in that time, isn't it? Yeah. But let's say we're even bored with that. You're bored already? Let's go further then. Let's go to the moon. Why not? I wonder how long it would take us to get to the moon going at 800 kilometers per hour. Well, this is how long it would take us to go to the moon. It would take us 20 days to go to the moon. Okay, so we would be well through the... Well, where, where would we be? Early May, early the month of May, anyhow, uh, before we would be at the moon. 20, about 20 days to go to the moon. What do you think? Worth it? Could be. No, not worth it. All right, okay. okay. Now... Let's say we're getting a bit cold, anything that I'm not at this moment. Let's say we wanted to go to the sun. Now, we need to be careful, okay, because you get more than a suntan as you get close to the sun. Yeah, you'd get burnt to a sizzle, wouldn't you? Oh, right, so we need to be careful. But the sun is an awful lot further away from us than the moon is. The moon, by far, is our nearest thing in space. If we wanted to go to the sun, it would take us 21 years to get to the sun if we were traveling at 800 kilometers per hour. 21 years. What age would you be? What age are you now? Nine? Oh, that's a nice easy one. What age would you be when you reach the sun? You would be 30. Yeah, you would. My goodness. What age would you say you were? Six. You were six. Just yesterday? Oh, happy birthday. And what age would you be then when you reached the sun? You would be six and 21 is 27. You'd be 27 when you reached the sun. Wow. Now let's say we we're, reckon that was a wee bit too dangerous, right? A bit hot and a bit dangerous. We'll go somewhere different and a bit more interesting. Well, why don't we go to Jupiter? That's one of our planets, and it's actually by far the biggest planet in what we call our solar system, right? It's far, far bigger than Earth, far, far bigger than Earth. So it would be interesting to see, would it not? So let's head off to the planet Jupiter, and let's see how long it'll take us to get to Jupiter. Oh, my goodness. It would take us 210 years to get to Jupiter. What age would you be then? You would be well over... What did you say? Would you say there nine? So you'd be 219 years old. Think of all the pension you would have got by that time on your way to Jupiter. Wow. About 100, you'd be allowed <laughs> You'll be at least that. So it would take you 210 years to get to Jupiter. Okay, one of the other planets around our sun. Now, you know our sun. You realize that, don't you, that our sun is our nearest star? Yeah, yeah. You've learned that in school, haven't you? That our sun is the nearest star that we have to us? Yeah, brilliant. Now, our next nearest star is this. This is the next nearest star to us beyond our sun and outside what we call our solar system. All right? It has a, it hasn't a very interesting name. It's actually called Proxima Centauri. A name. Wouldn't like a name like that, would you? No, definitely not. But that's it. Now, I wonder how long it would take us then to get to our next nearest star. Well, have a look.
It would take us six million years to get to our next nearest star. So you would be six million and nine. Six million and six. That's very old. That's really, really, really old. And that's our next nearest star. And beyond that star are actually billions, billions of other stars far, far further away than that. And hopefully when we think of that, we say, wow, wow, the universe is as big as that. And our God has made it all, every last star out there on the way there. He has made it all. But the wow gets even more than that because this God who has made all of that has also made us. And not only has he made us, but he, you know that word? No, everybody he, know, he does. He has made everybody and he knows everybody and he knows you. Knows your name. In fact, he even knows you better than you know yourself. Because you know what he knows that you don't know about yourself? He knows this. He knows the number of the hairs in your head. Jesus, his son, told us that. Hmm? I, I, he's bound to know how many teeth are wobbly if he knows the hairs in your head, doesn't he? And do you know what? It gets even better. Not only does he know us as well as that, but he... Yes, he does. And he loves us so much that he sent his son to die in our place so that one day we could go to be with him forever. And today, hopefully we think, wow, a God who knows us as well as that and who loves us as much as that. But his story doesn't even end there because on the first Easter Sunday, The one who died for us rose again from the dead, alive and with us. Alive and with us every day and every moment of every day and every night. And hopefully to that we say, wow, because that is just amazing. So thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. Speed off. And hopefully your journey won't take six million years. Right, what are we singing, Hannah? Oh yes, it's Living Hope. Modern worship song, Living Hope.
take a moment to pray again together, we pray. Lord, even on this, the brightest of Christian days, we, we are aware that darkness, death, and despair continue to stalk your world not least in Ukraine, where we are witnessing a barbarism that we thought was confined to history. We admit that we struggle to look at the images we're seeing. and We try not to think about what's being inflicted upon so many innocents, especially children and even babies. And even though we find it hard to watch, help us not to turn our hearts and our minds away to act and to think as if it weren't happening. Instead, give us a sensitivity that genuinely cares for the plight of so many who previously lived much as we live, but now whose homes and whose livelihoods, whose families and whose friends have been devastated. And Lord, if we feel for them in spite of our self-centeredness, how much more do you? So will you come in might and mercy, softening hard hearts, turning the minds of those who would conquer at any cost, and creating a willingness to work for a peaceful solution? And will you guide and bless those who are collecting aid, taking it out as near as they dare to the conflict, and will you continue to open hearts and open homes to those who flee in our direction? And while rightly we concentrate our thoughts and our prayers on this harder story, we don't forget those around us and nearer to us for whom today's bright message is just lost on them. Those who look out at Easter Sunday with tears in their eyes, feeling keenly their grief, their loss, their loneliness. Those who are blinded to it by disease or depression or disability. And those who find that they can't lift their spirits because they're fearful for the future, be it worry about test results or anxiety about how they're going to make ends meet. And as we think on these issues and concerns, how glad we are that we have an infinite God who can meet all of the needs of each of his children. And gladder still are we that that same God will one day take away all the dark side, all the pain, even all the discomfort. And on your renewed earth, there will be only peace and pleasure. For it shall be full of the knowledge of you, O Lord, as the waters cover the sea. Hasten that day, O God. Come, Lord Jesus, for your own sake and glory. Amen. <clears throat> we read a section from Luke's Gospel, 24th chapter. Uh, from verse 13, from verse 13 of Luke chapter 24. We read at verse 13, now that same day, that's the first day of the week, Sunday, two of them, two of the followers were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one living in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, 
and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our own, some of our women have amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Amen, and may God bless his word to us all. (coughs) This, This happens to be my favorite color. And I suppose when you have a wee look, it comes as no surprise. It has been my favorite color for as long as I can remember. But please don't ask me why. There is no rhyme or reason to it. It just happens to be. Could have been as easily, I suppose, yellow, red, blue, or green. And ditto this, my absolutely favorite pen has been for the last 15 and more years so that when they stopped making them just a few years back there was a minor panic and I rashly bought a couple of boxes of them so that if I'm ever going to get my money's worth and work my way through them I'm going to have to be blessed with a sound mind and a steady hand well into my 90s. Now, why is that my favorite? No reason. There are lots of similar pens, some of which write far more smoothly than this one. But this remains my favorite. I just don't know why. All of which makes another favorite entirely different. For I have a favorite Easter story, the one that we have just read together. The story of the two encountering the risen Jesus on the road to Emmaus. But this favorite, this favorite isn't like those other favorites, the favorite color, the favorite pen, the favorite 41 other things. Because I have worked out why this is my favorite Easter story. And it comes down to this. I identify with those two folk. I see myself in their shoes. Yes, even though they lived such a long way away from here, even though they lived such a long time ago, I feel a real affinity with them. I get where they're coming from. For one thing, I find that I identify with them in their experience of life, in their experience of life. Look at them as they wend their weary way to Emmaus. You can see the the sag in their shoulders, the frown on their faces. You can just imagine the perplexed tone in their voices, the tired way in which they just trudge home. Because these are puzzled people. These are disappointed people. These are folk who have been let down in life. 
They know what it is to have their their dreams shattered and their, their hopes dashed. In other words, they are folk like me. And I think folk like you. For hasn't that been our experience of life too? Oh, thank God, not all the time. Not all the time. Else life would be unbearable. But I don't think there's one of us here in this building who could stick a hand in the air and say truthfully, all my hopes have come true. All my dreams have been fulfilled. Not one of us could put a hand up and claim that. For my experience and yours is just like that Emmaus pair. We have been through the mill of disappointment. And we understand full well what it is to be heavy hearted. And I know that's part of the reason why I love this story. I feel an affinity with them in their experience of life. But my feeling of walking in their shoes doesn't actually stop there. For when I think of it, not only do I identify with them in their experience of life, but in truth, I also resemble them in their experience of the risen Jesus. In their experience of the risen Jesus. For think of it now, even though he was right there with them, they were unaware of the Lord walking right beside them. They were unaware of the Lord walking right beside them. And my, isn't that just like me? (laughs) And perhaps also like you. It was certainly true of that Emmaus pair. For they trod that road with saddened hearts and sagging shoulders. They trudged home dejectedly. And little did they know it, but the risen Jesus was walking right there with them. Oh, they thought that they were facing their problems alone. Or at best, they had each other for encouragement and support. But no, all the time right there was the one who specializes in giving rest to the weary, joy to the dejected, and strength to the weak. But they just didn't realize he was right there with them. And my, isn't that just like me? And maybe also just like you. For we worry, we fret, we sometimes lose sleep, we agonize over our options, wondering what we will do, what we should do, what we shouldn't. When right there beside us, longing for us to turn towards him and to lean upon him, right there is our risen, living Lord. My, my, I I am so like, I am so like those two on the road to Emmaus in my experience of the risen Jesus. Just as I feel an affinity with them in their experience of life, But you know, in truth, the similarities don't even stop there. For not only do I know heartache and disappointment, as they did, not only do I often fail to see Jesus walking alongside me, as they did, but I see myself all too often like them in their experience of Easter in their experience of Easter. And what was their experience of Easter? Well, it was just this. They had heard the reports that Jesus really was alive. They'd heard the reports, but the reality had not broken in upon them. You remember? They left, when they left Jerusalem, they had heard the reports of the woman. They had heard about the empty tomb. They had heard about the angel saying, he is not here, he is risen. 
Yes, all that and more they had heard, undoubtedly. But instead of being on top of the world, they just trudged home, the bottom having fallen out of their world. So not bubbling with joy, but burdened by fears and misgiving. And all for this reason, they had heard the reports, but the reality hadn't broke broken in upon them. And here's the scene in that film where the penny for them finally drops. And folks, I'll not speak for you, I'll not dare to speak for you, but I'll admit this of myself. I am too much like them in their experience of Easter. For the truth of it, the fact of it, is lodged securely in my head. I have known that truth for as long as I can remember and believed it, believed it sincerely and without doubt for as long as I can remember. But I have to admit that that truth has not sufficiently permeated my heart. It has not turned my world upside down the way it should. That's perhaps why I can honestly say that for the last 40-something years, from the very first time I heard this man's story, not an Easter has gone past without me thinking about him And not just thinking about him, but actually coveting, being jealous of his 1871 Easter experience. This man was called R.W. Deal. He was always just known by his initials, R.W. Deal. He was the greatly gifted minister of a huge congregation in Birmingham, England. By the year... 1871, R.W. Deal had been minister of that massive congregation for close on 20 years. And so for at least 20 years, R.W. Deal had read with care the Easter story, focusing on some aspect of it for his Easter sermons. In other words, he knew the story inside out I have no doubt that he could have recited it by heart. But in 1871, as he studied it yet again, quite suddenly, out of the blue, the reality of it, the reality of it dawned on him. And he sprang up from the desk And he paced up and down in his study, saying over and over to himself, Christ is living. Christ is living. Living as really as I'm living. Christ is living. And what had happened to that good and godly man? Well, simply this, that the reports of Easter, the reports that he had known for years and believed for years, They had suddenly become a reality. They had moved, if you like, from his head to his heart. And needless to say, the man and his ministry were never the same again. And I have to say, I find that deeply moving and immensely challenging. And my wish for me My wish for you is that something more of that reality would be ours. For then, come tomorrow, come next week with Easter as far away as ever. Then, for us then, it wouldn't be, it couldn't be just back to the old routine. No, then, if we'd really got it, there would be new life. There would be new courage. There would be new comfort. There would be new energy. And all because we would be sure 
at last, sure, that the risen, living Christ really is with us every hour of every day. May God grant all of us a little more of that for our good and his glory. A moment of prayer together. Lord Jesus, in our mind's eye, we can picture those two trudging their way home to Emmaus. And how could it be other than trudging and wearisome? For their hopes had been dashed, their limbs ached, feet felt like lead, disappointment written all over their faces. That is until you, Lord Jesus, slipped into step with them ready to hear what was on their hearts, willing to listen as they poured out the issues that weighed them down, and then turning their perspective right around, their hearts burning instead of burdened, their eyes open instead of blinkered, and their legs suddenly fresh and ready to race to tell of their encounter with you. And all because you had walked and talked with them. And dear Lord, we earnestly feel our need of you walking and talking with us. Warming our hearts. Opening our eyes. And energizing us. For we admit our discouragement. Our discouragement as we realize that our faith. Our love, our hope, aren't what they should be. Our discouragement too, Lord Jesus, as we see your church, your body, surely a pale shadow of what it's meant to be and what it once was. So Lord, will you again walk with us and talk with us? And even if we should not have an Emmaus encounter that changes everything, may we in mercy at least have an encounter that changes some things, making us more the people you call us to be, blessing those with whom we live and work, and above all, bringing praise and pleasure to you, our risen, living right alongside us, Lord. Amen. And so we conclude our service as we sing, Thine be the glory, risen, conquering Son.
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all and with all those whom we hold on our hearts this Easter day and forevermore. Amen.